Hello. Thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, it's great to see you all here, especially in such a busy baseball week. I think we lucked out having the one night where there is not a Red Sox game. Um, <laughs> um, and yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you to the Gottlieb for hosting us here in this beautiful space. Um, and we're very excited for this installment of this series. And I, my name is Laura Maris. I'm the director of the Favorite Poem Project. And we're, this, is, this series is always very special, but it's especially important tonight because not only are we here to hear Marilyn Chin, we're also here to help launch her brand new book, uh, Portrait of a Self as Nation. <laughs> Um, so we will have copies of this for sale afterwards. Stick around for book signing um, and reception. And for those of you who like to plan really far ahead, um, the next installment of this series will be with Mark Halliday and BU alum Heather Green on April 11th. So if you'd like to put that in your calendar now, you're welcome to. And I will now turn it over to the director of creative writing, Robert Pinsky, who will introduce the series. Thank you very much, Laura Maris. Laura Maris, who makes it all happen and run. It's my job to explain this occasion. Nancy Livingston, who with her husband, Fred Levin, established this series a good number of years ago now. Nancy is a very esteemed and expert professional in the field that she insists on calling advertising. She doesn't choose the euphemism public relations. And when the reading series was established, Nancy talked to me and others about the BU writing program. And she knew that in room 222, where Carl Kirchway and I still teach the writing seminars in the MFA program, where Ha Jin and Leslie Epstein and Sigrid Nunez still teach the fiction classes. In that room, the poet Robert Lowell taught a class in which the students included George Starbuck, who later became on the writing faculty here, Anne Sexton and Sylvia Plath. And Nancy is the one, Nancy Levin is the one who came up with the term, in the spirit of room 222. And that spirit, in a word, is the spirit of art. And the idea was that we would have a reading by an established, distinguished visitor, tonight Marilyn Chin, and by a recent BU alum, tonight Tara Skirtu. And that the spirit would be as when those three poets were in a seminar together not the spirit of an academic pecking order or that one person necessarily was going to evaluate the others, that that was a one-way process, but that they were courting art together. A spirit that is happy to be a guest in the academic world, but is also a different element. So tonight, you'll hear Tara Skirtu, a BU alumna, give a brief reading, and then introduce Marilyn Chin, the headliner. And the spirit is, these are two super energetic poets who understand all kinds of outside worlds and the inside world. And they will show us ways into and of the art of poetry tonight. Here is Tara who will introduce Marilyn then we'll clap, and then Marilyn will appear. First, Tara gives her reading. Thank you. Wow, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, it's quite an honor. Um, I'm so excited I got thrown off. Thank you, Laura Maris. Thank you, Robert Pinsky, Favorite Poem Project. I'm going to start with the title poem of my new book called The Amoeba Game. I had to be in Girl Scouts when I was a kid because my mom was a Girl Scout leader, and I didn't want to be in Girl Scouts. 
But we played this weird game one day, and I'm really grateful now because I have a book after this game. <laughs> the amoeba game. I stood at the stove, holding a wooden spoon in my right hand, listening to butter sputtering against the splattered circle of an egg. Perhaps it was the flapping of the egg's wavy edges against the steel pan or the amorphousness of its innards outside the carriage of its brown shell. I remembered an odd game I played in brownies, the amoeba game. In the front yard of the scout cabin, one girl at a time would become an amoeba and lead the rest. We didn't know what amoebas were, only that they weren't human or animal and moved like a thousand blind legs treading through molasses. So it was that our heads and arms became legs and feet, undulating wayward into dusk. Swaying our shoulders left to right, we'd giggle through mouths we weren't supposed to have, pretending we had no eyes and didn't know where we came from or where we were going. I have new poems for the first time in forever. I wrote a poem on inauguration day, and then I didn't write another poem for a year and a half. <laughs> and I visited this uh, memorial to the victims of communism in northern Romania, which was a former communist prison. And I wrote this poem the day Trump was inaugurated. On Inauguration Day, I remember a visit to the memorial of the victims of communism and of the resistance. Behind the glass, a bloodied roll of gauze unravels poetry stitched with wires shed from a broom. Alone in a cell, a man would slap Morse code onto his thigh, feeding possibility to the other men in the block. I walk into Yuliu Maniu's death cell. On the floor, a dented aluminum bowl and spoon, empty bucket, cup. Caught without a mattress, striped uniform draped at the foot. One cell is now the poetry room. Morse crackling through the speakers, photographs of anonymous wall poems. I will die without knowing, without dying. The man who stitched poetry in code was condemned to death for trying to get medical attention for a fugitive wanted by the Securitate. Where? Who? Why? I think of my sister on another continent, five years in America's largest women's maximum security for resisting arrest with nonviolence as a teenager. Another two years for another minor offense, now a motherless mother with a motherless child. I enter the black cell, really a torture room. Shackles anchored to the stone floor of a shoebox room without windows. Everyone else who reads the placard at the door keeps walking. Madness in great ones must not unwatched go. In a women's prison outside Boston, one of my best college students, thrown into solitary for weeks, managed to write a paper diagnosing Hamlet's madness in a hole meant to drive her mad and turned it in on time. The virtue of will. Make the mad guilty and appall the free. No one stops me as I leave the room. In the courtyard, a grassy hill bearing citrus covers a domed memorial. I enter through its concrete door. A round stone table like a retina, its surface water. 
beeswax candles lit in memory of someone, of someone's someone, flame toward an open cross in the ceiling. It's starting to rain. Drops tap the table. I am becoming aware that I might be falling into a love beyond the limits of restraint. I know without knowing. Twelve lit candles light the water table. I've been here alone so long, I've lit at least half of them. For no one in particular. For you, and you, and you. That one had two lines from Hamlet that I can't own myself. Soup in Romania is really intense because they have two kinds. There's chorba and there's soup. And they're kind of the same thing to me, but they are not the same thing to Romanians. Heart soup. My grandmother once told me every Romanian dish begins with a sauteed onion, you say, dicing a strong purple onion. Tonight, we're making heart soup. We've been preparing for this. Earlier, you transferred a carton of chicken hearts from the freezer to the fridge, and I tried not to think about another man. My only task, methodically cube the potatoes, five of them. You stir the onions, valves popping in the oil. I chop and chop and chop. Tonight, we are not simply making soup. You don't eat soup, you say, only chorba, and tell me the difference. Which is that the celery root, carrot, pepper are grated, and you leave it to boil and boil and boil. This sounds like soup to me. Our broth doesn't sound like water boiling, because tonight the stock is made of metaphors, a whole carton of pieces of them. Monday, another man wrote, too scared to use the present tense. We're making tachycardia soup tonight, and the other man writes to say he's broken out in hives, allergic to food. I've never been allergic to what I've craved. It's half past 10, and our soup is ready for the parsley. The hearts are for flavor, not to eat. You try not to leave any for me. I can't dissociate flavor from function. You hold up a ladle and ask how to say it in English. Teach me polonique. We sit at our bowls, facing each other, spooning pieces of valve onto a waste plate. You break today's loaf of bread. Did you know that a person who's had a heart transplant can develop insatiable cravings for his donor's favorite foods? This morning, on the news, the translation of Friday's forecast, instability returns. This soup needs salt, you say, and we salt it to our own tastes. I was on an airplane recently with a jerk I was on an airplane a couple years ago writing poems with a fountain pen, and I learned that's a bad idea. Writing poetry is like fielding ground balls. Someone is smoking in the lavatory, and one of the flight attendants says, shit. And she gets on the mic and says, whoever this is will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law upon landing. While I'm writing, I hate ballpoint pens with a ballpoint pen because they don't spray my period brown ink all over the white designer jeans of the gorgeous Miami woman to my right, which was how I learned not to write poems in a metal box in the sky with a 1930s Schaefer fountain pen. And I was the one waiting at the lavatory door when we all smelled the smoke and didn't know what to do. And I'd already been between two bombs at a bombing. So after being ordered back to my seat with a full bladder of wine, I order a whiskey. 
and this turns the Romanian flight attendant on, who winks and gives me nuts and olives on the house. And by now I know again, we aren't about to explode this time, and swallow my nip and eat my snacks and continue with this ballpoint pen I hate, writing what will 19 days short of two years from now become a poem. And we land in Bucharest, and everyone but me claps in perfect post-communist unison, and the smoking man gets away with it. I have two more short poems. I was raised Catholic, so I know all about guilt. Guilt eater. My mother's God, her mother's, her mother's mother's. He feeds us his guilt, and we eat it, like a dog eats a foul thing twice, and do it again and again. I turn you to face me, take all of your sleeping breath in. I'm from a line of guilt eaters. I'm learning to keep it down. In a teeny tiny poem, I just changed the title back. It's called Courage. Bring a lamp into this room. I want the last thing you see to be my face. Thank you. I'm terrified to write anything that isn't a poem, so I have been thinking about this introduction for months. <laughs> It's not the most traditional. I am so completely honored to be here reading with Marilyn Chin. So I'm going to start this question with a one, or this, this introduction, with a one question Q&A. Marilyn Chin has said that her work is steeped with the themes and travails of exile, loss, and assimilation. Then her question, what is the loss of country if it were not the loss of self. And I think the title of her new book answers this question quite well. What is the loss of country if it were not the loss of self? Portrait of the self as nation. New and selected poems. To me, reading Marilyn Chin's poems is like navigating that unavoidable dream no matter the surprise swerve, you go with it and arrive at the place of facing your many identities. When we approach our own death in dreams, our identities somehow remain. This near-death moment short circuits our nervous system and we naturally reroute ourselves, become alive again in a new environment, follow a song, someone we love, try to see if we still recognize ourselves. Maybe we're relieved or full of fear's adrenaline. We wake up. Marilyn Chin's poems, to me, are like constantly approaching this dream moment of death and after death. They make us come alive. She has said of herself, I am an activist poet. And her poems activate us. In addition to being a poet, translator, anthologist, novelist, and educator, she is a shapeshifter, a form and language neologist. Have you heard of sonnet knees? A daredevil, for her work is indeed daring, an experimental composer. It is a difficult exploratory challenge to try to describe Marilyn Chin, the poet. A Los Angeles review of books profile describes her as poet of contradictions, poignant sentiment, beat your ass toughness and unexpected humor. In her own words, from the preface of A Portrait of the Self as Nation, New and Selected Poems, which we are launching here tonight, she writes that she has sought to be an activist, subversive, radical, immigrant, feminist, transnational, Buddhist, neoclassical nerd poet. 
This makes my job at describing her in my own words pretty easy, right? But I'll add one more adjective to this list. She is a truly badass poet. Please welcome one of our country's most prominent culturally and socially engaged poets, Marilyn Chin, with whom it is an absolute honor to be here tonight. I want to thank Robert Pinsky and Laura Maris for, uh, and, and, the, and the posse for bringing me here. I just, uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. And, and this is, the book came out last week. So we're really celebrating tonight, right? And, and I talked to, yeah, uh, Robert about this. When you, when one has, comes out with a new and selected, does that mean we're old? <laughs> we're, does that mean we're sage-like? Oh, I'm beginning to look like Yoda, maybe. So um, I'm going to first begin with um, some identity anthems. And we're talking about the wheel coming back. You know, the identity, an identity poems are back in vogue. Political poems are back in vogue. Who, wow, I guess, I guess Trump brought it on. So, um, so I'll begin with this poem called How I Got That Name. And I'm going I'm to read three poems that the students love. I mean, for, yeah, and, and this one uh, de they definitely love. It's called How I Got That Name, an essay on assimilation. I am Marilyn Mailing Chin. Oh, how I love the resoluteness of that first person singular, followed by that stalwart indicative, a B without that uncertain ing of becoming. Of course, the name had been changed somewhere between Angel Island and the sea, when my father, the paper son, the late 1950s, obsessed with a bombshell blonde, transliterated Mei Ling to Maryland. <laughs> Nobody dared question his initial impulse, for we all know lust drove men to greatness, not goodness, not decency. And there I was, a wayward pink baby, named after some tragic white woman, swollen with gin and nembutal. My mother couldn't pronounce the R. She dubbed me number one female offshoot for brevity. Henceforth, she will live and die in sublime ignorance, flanked by loving children in the kitchen deity, while my father dithers a tomcat in Hong Kong trash a gambler, a petty thug, who bought a chain of chop suey joints in Piss River, Oregon, with bootleg Gucci cash. Nobody dared question his integrity, given his nice, devout daughters and his bright, industrious sons, as if filial piety were the standard by which all earthly men were measured. Oh, how trustworthy our daughters, how thrifty our sons, how we managed to fool the experts in education, statistics, and demography. We're not very creative, but not adverse to rote learning, rote learning, rote learning. <laughs> Indeed, they can use us. But the model minority is a tease. We know you are watching now, and we refuse to give you any. Oh, bamboo shoots, bamboo shoots, the further west we go, we'll hit east. The deeper down we dig, we'll find China. History has turned its stomach on a black polluted beach where life doesn't hinge on that red, red wheelbarrow. But whether or not our new lover in that final episode of Santa Barbara will lean over a scented candle and call us a bitch. Oh Lord, where have we gone wrong? We have no inner resources. <laughs> then one redolent spring mor morning, the great patriarch Chin peered down from his kiosk in heaven and saw that his descendants were ugly. One had a squarish head and a nose without a bridge. Another's profile long and knobbed as a gourd. A third, the sad, brutish one, may never, never marry. And I, his least favorite, not quite boiled, not quite cooked, a plump pomfret simmering in my juices. Two listless, 
to fight for my people's destiny. To kill without resistance is not slaughter, says the proverb. So I wait for imminent death. The fact that death is also metaphorical is testament to my lethargy. So here lies Marilyn Mailing Chin, married once, twice to so-and-so, a Lee and a Wong, daughter of the virtuous Yuquin Wong and Gigi Chin, the infamous, sister of a dozen, cousin of a million, survived by everybody and forgotten by all. She was neither black nor white, neither cherished nor vanquished, just another squatter in own bamboo grove, minding her poetry, when one day heaven was unmerciful and a chasm opened where she stood, like the jaws of a mighty white whale or the maw of a metaphysical Godzilla. It swallowed her whole. She did not flinch, nor writhe, nor fret about the afterlife, but stayed solid as wood, happily, though gnawed, tattered, mesmerized by all that was lavished upon her and all that was taken away. Now, now some young dudes over there thought this was uh, spoken word. This, is, this precedes spoken word. <laughs> It's called, it's called a dramatic monologue. I just, I, yeah, um, but I guess, you know, I guess it's spoken word. I, maybe it's a speech act in my generation. <laughs> maybe it's called a speech act. Um, the, can you hear me with this one? The, with, with this? Okay. Either way? Okay. Um, there are many ways to, to write a... Uh, in an um, identity anthem, and this one is a blues poem. It's called Blues on Yellow. I'll read this one for Robert, because he loves the blues and jazz. And, um, it's called Blues on Yellow. The canary died in the gold mine. Her dreams got lost in the sieve. The canary died in the gold mine. Her dreams got lost in the sieve. Her husband, the crow, killed under the railroad. The spokes has shorn his wings. Something's cooking in Chin's kitchen. 10,000 yellow-bellied sapsuckers baked in a pie. Something's cooking in Chin's kitchen. 10,000 yellow-bellied sapsuckers baked in a pie. Something's cooking in Chin's kitchen. Die, die, yellow bird. Die, die. Oh, crack an egg on the griddle. Yellow will ooze into white. Oh, crack an egg on the griddle. Yellow will ooze into white. Run, run, sweet little Puritan. Yellow will ooze into white. If you cut my yellow wrists, I'll teach my yellow toes to write. If you cut my yellow wrists, I'll teach my yellow toes to write. If you cut my yellow fists, I'll teach my yellow feet to fight. Do not be afraid to perish, my mother, Buddha's compassion is nigh. Do not be afraid to perish, my mother. Our boat will sail tonight. Your babies will reach the promised land. The stars will be their guide. I am so mellow yellow, mellow yellow, Buddha sings in my veins. I am so mellow yellow, mellow yellow, Buddha sings in my veins. Oh, take me to the land of the unreborn. There's no life on earth without pain. You have to have the word pain in a, in a blues poem, right? <laughs> so, um, um, so I love form, and that's, and that's um, 
that's a blues poem form, very strict, uh, full rhymes, um, three, you know, three line stanzas and so forth after uh, Bessie Smith. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I said in my interview that I would read some sonnets because, uh, um, because I learned a lot about the sonnet uh, from the great Robert Lowell. I have his thousand page tome <laughs> in my library and how many sonnets did he write? I mean, and what I learned from him is this, is that um, when one has that base, one can go off on different tangents and and he, he had such a facility that he wrote hundreds of sonnets and, you, and he never tired of the form. And, I, and so I wrote a bunch of sonnets and I call them Sonnet Nice because they're, they're, uh, I use a sonnet base, but I use some Chinese lyrics. You know, I, I, uh, so it's, uh, it's a hybrid form. I, I try to... Um, which one should I read first? I'll read a shocking one first. <laughs> Just to, okay, I'll read this. This one is called, So You Fucked John Dunn. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you're gonna write um, a sonnet, you've got to, you got to address John Dunn because he wrote the most brilliant sonnets on earth, right? Besides the, the bard himself, right? So, uh, so, yeah, so this is. So you fucked John Dunn. Wasn't very nice of you. He was betrothed to God, you know. A diet of worms for you. That is a total nerdy reference, okay. So you fucked John Keats. He's got the sickness, you know. You took precautions, you say. So you fucked him anyway. John Dunn, John Keats, John Gravara, John Wong, John Kennedy, Johnny John John, the beautiful, the reckless, the strong. Poor thing, you had no self-worth then. You fucked them all for a song. Is that a bad pun, the song? Okay, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so this, this is uh, a sonnet niece. I'll, I'll <laughs> I mean, this, we're in Kennedy territory, so I had to <laughs> do that one. Um, Um, this one I wrote for the Ten Anman, Ten Anman Incident, and um, I guess this is a sonnet, yeah, and um, it's called Ten Anman, the Aftermath. You, you, some of you are too young. Do you remember the Ten Anman Incident? 1890, uh, 1989? 18, okay, okay. 1989, and I remember that, that picture of that young student, his arm against a, a tank. Okay, so I wrote, I wrote this uh, for that student. It's called Ten Anman, the Incident, uh, the Aftermath. There was blood and guts all over the road. I said, I'm sorry, darling, and rode over, expecting the slate to be clean, but she came. She who was never alive became resurrected. I saw her in dream, a young girl in a chi pao, bespeckled, forever lingering, thriving on the other side of the world, walking in my souls as I walked, crying in my voice as I cried. When she arrived, I felt my knuckles in her knock, her light looming over the city's great hollows. Hope lies within another country's semaphores, the goddess of liberty, the statue of mercy. We have it all wrong, big boy. How we choose to love, how we choose to destroy, says Zhuangzi, is written in heaven. 
but leave the innocent ones alone, those alive yet stillborn, undead yet waiting in a fitful sleep, undeserved of an awakening. So, this I wrote for the Tenarmen. Um, okay, this one. This sonnet, niece, this sonnet is called Black President. And you know who I wrote this for. <laughs> okay. Black President. If a black man could be president, could a white man be his slave? Could a sinner enter heaven by uttering his name? If the Terminator is my governor, <laughs> could a cowboy be my king? When shall the cavalry enter Deadwood and save my prince? An exo-cannibal eats her enemies. An endo-cannibal eats her friends. <laughs> I'd rather starve myself silly than to make amends. Blood on the altar, blood on the lamb, blood in the chalice, not symbolic, but fresh. <laughs> so those are my, you know, just a, a few of the sonnets that, that I've written, or the sonnet niece or sonnet-like things um, that I, I find, um, well, go back to Lowe's, you know, many, many sonnets. I mean, it's amazing that he could, I mean, he wrote them just, you know, in his diary, like, like diary poems, right? I mean, it's just amazing how he had such a facility with the sonnet. Um, so um, so the, <laughs> I praise <laughs> uh, Mr. Lowell. I guess I told my, the class this afternoon I would read the 25 haiku, the bad girl, libidinous haiku. The haiku is a very, I, I think it's been reinvented by African Americans. Um, because, do you know uh, Etheridge Knight and his prison haiku? Sonia Sanchez and her, you know, and her, and her, hai, her blues haiku? They, re, you know, and Richard Wright apparently wrote hundreds of haiku, um, and so I think I think they, they're, it's really a, uh, become an American pop form because high school students write haiku. I mean, we write terrible cheesy haiku to our beloved. I mean, it's just you know, it's really turned into an, um, a pop American pop form. So, um, and. And the African American poet sort of brought brought you know this uh, the um, protest you know uh, poem and you know into the haiku. Um, so this is twenty five haiku, uh, the libidinous bad girl haiku, anti Zen because I can't I, uh, I can't meditate for the life of me so I can't the um, twenty five haiku. A hundred red fire ants scouring, scouring the white peony. <laughs> Fallen plum blossoms return to the branch. You sleep, then harden again. Cuttlefish in my palm stiffens with rigor mortis. Boy toys can't love. <laughs> Neighbors barn, grass mat, crickets, blue boy, trowel handle, dress soaked in mud. Iron headed mace, double studded halberd, slice into emptiness. Oh, fierce oh goose, tie me to two wild elephants, tear me in half. Oh, my swarthy herder, too humped Bactrian, drive me the long distance. Forceps, tongs, bushy, whip, flanks, scabbard, stirrup, 
goats, distaff, wither, owl. That's, that's more like um, Uncle Ginsburg and, and Uncle Whitman. Um, you know, I, Black-eyed Susan's Queen Anne's lace, bounty of cyclamen, moan pass erupt. Gaze at the charred hills, the woe-be-gone kiosks. We are all God's hussies. I have not fondled the emperor's lapdog, whose name is Black Muzzle. Urge your horses into the Miss Swill Galilee, O oh, sweet bedlamite. Her Majesty's randing up the jewel stairs to find the pleasure dome. Ancient pond, the frog jumps in and in and in. The deep slap of water. The frog jumps into the ancient pond. She says, no, I am not ready. <laughs> Coyote cooked his dead wife's vagina and fed it to his new wife. I plucked out three white pubic hairs, and they turned into flying monkeys. <laughs> Let's do it on the antimacassar, on the antimacassar. That's a real nerdy reference there. Little Red drew her teeny pistol from her basket and said, eat me. <laughs> Chimera, Madame Popot grafting a date tree onto a date tree. His unworthy appendage, his mutinous henchmen graze my pink cheeks. He on top now changes to bottom. Goddess welcomes her devotee. Fish, fish, foul, foul. Mock me, mistress bean curd. I am both duck and essence. Sing, sing, little yellow blight. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Don't touch him, bitch. We're engaged. And besides, he's wearing my nipple ring. <laughs> the last haiku is a found haiku. I, I stole it from one of my students who was saying something to that effect into her cell phone. So the last one is stolen, a found haiku. So yes, I, you know, you know, so I had to fight the patriarchy. You know, the Basho's frog. I have to, you know, um, yeah, I have to subvert and pervert it to, <laughs> so that I can write a haiku. I mean, that's what happened, right? Students this afternoon, what, uh, is there a poem you want to hear? Hey. What's your favorite? What's my favorite? I can choose amongst my children? That's, you know, I love playing with forms, and it's kind of weird because um, because you, ex you expect an activist poet to not love the traditions, but I love all kinds of poetry. I love the traditions, and I think maybe that's why I'm still around. <laughs> because I can play with the traditions and not tire you know, of writing poems. I just love, you know, I love playing with, uh, so this is a new, uh, a new poem, um, newish, it was, it's called Bamboo the Dance. And, uh, and I, um, I wrote for the Tourettesen uh, Music uh, Foundation. They had that, that 70th, um, uh, yeah, they had that 70th anniversary uh, anthology, um, uh, the seventh, uh, promoting the 70th, the 70th um, 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 ex, you know, um, escape, you know, uh, escape from the, uh, from the camps. And so, um, so I, um, so I wrote this for, uh, this poem for, uh, for that anthology. And I call it a dance because the first draft I wrote uh, while watching ribbon dancers at the Black Bamboo, Bamboo Park in Beijing. And I saw them do the ribbon dance, but then I went home and I I wrote I I, um, I read um, Paul Ceylon's uh, beautiful um, 
a fugue. And so this is in the form of a fugue. So it's called Bamboo the Dance. How free and lush the bamboo grows, the bamboo grows and grows. Shoots and morasses, fillies and lasses, and shreds and beds and rows. O oh, phloem and pistol nodes and ovules, the bamboo grows and grows. Her release, her joy, her oil, her toil, her moxie, her terror, her swirl. Dig deeper into soil, deeper into her her soul, what do you find in my girl? Thrash of black hair and silken snare, face in the bottom of the world. Bound by ankles, poor dear, poor sow, oh delicate hooves and fascicles. Dead doe, dead doe, dead doe. Wrists together, searing red tethers, blood draining from her souls. O oh, choir, O oh, psalm, O oh, soaring, fearsome tabernacle. The bamboo grows, the bamboo grows and grows through antlers and eye holes. O oh, sweet soul, O oh, sweet, sweet soul. Thin green tails, purple in trails, the bamboo grows and grows. She flailed and wailed through flimsy veils, through bones and hissing marrow. Nobody to hear her but wind and chaff, a gasp, then letting go. They loved her, then stoned her, buried her near her ancestors, my mother, my sister, my soul. Shimmering mesh, a brocade sash, hanging on a distant oracle. Springboks dance on shallow mounds, echoes, Echoes, echoes. So this is the bamboo, the dance. Thank you. Um, I've been working on the uh, Chinese quatrain, the Chinese American quatrain for years. So it's a, um, um, there, you know, uh, most of them are, are, are four line, you know, uh, compressed pieces. They're like little jewels, little pearls I put in a necklace and I, uh, I just play around the, with their order and so forth. Uh, but this one is, is more um, leaning toward, you know, it's an elegy that's, that's leaning toward the Western tradition of song, of, of mourning, uh, and, it, uh, and of story. It's a, um, so um, for most an elegy is for, for my uh, love Charles, who, who died in, uh, in an airplane accident. And he's, uh, he's, he, would, uh, he was a French Algerian Jew. Okay. You have lived six decades. And I, okay, Formosa, because do you know what Formosa means? It's Taiwan, it's a, yeah, yeah, beautiful, beautiful, uh, yeah, it's, it's the uh, colonial, colonial name for Taiwan. So this is um, Formosan elegy. You have lived six decades, and you have lived none. You have loved many, and you have loved no one. You wedded three wives, but you lie in your cold bed alone. You sired four children, but they cannot forgive you. Knock at emptiness a house without your love. Strike the pine box, no answer, all hollow. You planted plums near the gate, but they bear no fruit. You raised herbs in the veranda, fresh and savory. I cry for you, but no sound wells up in my throat. I sing for you, but my tears have dried in my gullet. Walk the old dog, give the budgies a cool bath. Cut a tender melon, let it bleed into memory. The robe you washed hangs like a carcass flayed. The mug you love is stained with old coffee. Your toothbrush is silent. Grease mums your comb. Something's lost, something's made strong. Around the corner, a new prince yearns to be loved. A fresh turn of phrase, a bad strophe erased. A, a random image crafts itself into a poem. A sleepless Taipei night, a mosquito's symphony. Who will cry for you, me and your sister, Colette? Who will cry for you, me and your Algerian sister? 
You were a rich man, but you held on to your poverty. You were a poor man who loved gold over dignity. I sit near your body bag and sing you a last song. I sit near your body bag and chant your final sutra. What's our place on earth? Nada, nada, nada. What's our destiny? War, grief, maggots, nada. Arms, cheeks, cock, femur, eyelids, nada. Cow, ox, lamb, vellum, marrow, nada. Vova, nada. Semen, nada. Ovum, nada. Eternity, nada. Heaven, nada. Void, nada. Birth and death, the same blackened womb. Birth and death, the same white body bag. Detach, detach, we enter the world alone. Detach, detach, we leave the world bone lonely. If we can't believe in God, we must believe in love. We must believe in love, we must believe in love. And they zip you up in your white body bag. White body bag, white, white body bag. So. Okay. All right, dudes, any requests from those dudes back? <laughs> the what? Cougar poem. Okay, oh my God, this guy, this guy, he's into cougars already. <laughs> okay. Uh, what? Is it hip to go out with cougars now? What is going on? <laughs> cougar. Oh. <laughs> All right. Cougar synonymous. Synonymous spelled like S I N O N Y M O. U.S. So these are Chinese cougars. <laughs> Cougar Sina. My grandpa was 80. My grandma was 20. She cried for years for the good life she was missing. She faced the wall until he finished his dying. Then she polished his bones for all of eternity. Such entitlement, my prickly little prince, waving a pistol and a crumpled Ben Franklin. Don't you know I'm a citizen of my own bed? I paid for my passage. I owe you nothing. Throw my girl into the river. She won't drown. Like her mother before her and her mother's mother, Stubborn reed, hollow at both ends. She whistle and hum and float in to dawn. The man from Worcester wants to eat my sister. He bends her backward, coats her in rice flour, pinches her corners, calls her sweet dumpling, fries her in deep oil, then serves her on porcelain. Who is the Buddha, a shit wiping gum stick? Who is the Buddha, a painter's triptych? Who is the Buddha, he is naked, utterly naked? Who is the Buddha, a stelly, a herd boy, a sweet nothing? When I saw his corpse, I knew he was mine, a flash of kerosene, epaulets, cheap aftershave. His flesh burnt black, his mouth agape, silently shouting, another woman's name, a flower and yet not a flower, a dream and yet not a dream. At midnight, he comes to my bed. At daylight, he returns to the dead. Hold on to your boy soldier on the moonlit, moonlit path. I am an urban cougar on the sunset prowl. Once I take his nape in my bloody mouth, He'll beg and moan and succumb to God. 
his love root dangling before a crimson sack, his tresses long, disheveled, and raven black, my warrior, my warrior, mounting a tall horse, my thigh bird is calling, she wants you back. My cousin calls him Allah, my sister calls him Jesus, my brother calls him Krishna, my mother calls him Gatma. I call him and call him on his cell phone and he does not answer. <laughs> I climb the Acropolis, swim in the Aegean, flirt with Koros, but don't give him my name, drink tea at high noon, eat octopus at dusk, a woman at 40 is proud of her lust. Hell no, dude bro, you think you own this poetry? I see your lips trembling, counting syllables, cry epiphany long before the penultimate turn, a dry cough and a verse hits the ceiling. Okay, that's <laughs> what they say about a woman at 45, too late to live too soon to die. My wine is bittersweet. My song is wry. My yoni is still tight. My puma is on fire. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. It's very <laughs> That's the Cougar Synonymous. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll end with um, this poem that that the students love. It's called The Floral Apron, and I've, I've received so many emails and, um, yeah, uh, regarding this poem. And, um, and in, in 2012, um, some students in Hong Kong voted it to represent Hong Kong in the 2012 uh, London Olympics. But I, uh, for, you know, uh, for the BBC and I emailed the BBC and, and told them that I'm not an, I'm not a citizen of Hong Kong. I am an American citizen. And, and they said, "Oh, it's okay. You can <laughs> you still represent Hong Kong. I guess um, I guess it didn't, it is, yeah, it didn't matter. Yeah, I mean citizenship. I guess is a, a roaming citizenship. Okay. Um, okay." The floral apron. The woman wore a floral apron around her neck. The woman from my mother's village with a sharp cleaver in her hand. She said, what shall we cook tonight? Perhaps these six tiny squid lined up so perfectly on the block. She wiped her hand on the apron, pierced the blade into the first there was no resistance, no blood, only cartilage, soft as a child's nose. Alas, iota of ink made us wince. Suddenly, the aroma of ginger and scallion fogged her, our senses. Then we absolved her for that moment's barbarism. Then she, an elder of the tribe, without formal headdress, without elegance, deign to teach the younger about the Asian plight. And although we have traveled far, we must never forget that primal lesson on patience, courage, forbearance, on how to love squid despite squid, how to honor the village, the tribe, that floral apron 